So you want to be an Android app developer, huh? Well, good, you're in the right spot. The goal of this video and the ones to follow is going to be giving you the necessary tools and understanding of all the fundamentals for Android to help you be successful in making your applications. But this video will be the first steps again going, and the first steps are get Android Studio, get a project created, and then understand how the project is laid out. Well, let's get started on that, shall we? The first step is getting Android Studio, and this is pretty much mandatory, so you can either click the link in the description or go to something like duckduckgo.com, type Android Studio, and click on the first option here. This will bring you to a download page. One of the great things about Android Studio and Android development in general is that it's very accessible. All you really need is a computer and any major operating system. It works fine on Linux, Mac, Windows, and Chrome OS. Although there are some alternatives to Android Studio, I strongly recommend just sticking to Android Studio. Anyway, go ahead and click on download, follow the instructions that are appropriate for your system, and then open it when you're done. Once you've finished installing Android Studio, if you've opened it up, you're going to land on this screen here. Go ahead and click Create New Project. The next thing it's going to do is it's going to ask you to choose a project template. And there's really no wrong answers here. You can pick whichever one you like. And don't worry, if you don't pick the one you want, you can always make a new activity later. And then it'll have you pick from this set again. For our example today, I'm just going to pick an empty activity. The next step is going to be choosing a name for your application. This is going to be the actual thing that's shown on the device itself. So you can name it whatever you want. For mine, I'm just going to call it Engineer Man. For the package name, you can just leave that as a default in the save location, pick wherever you want it to save. I'm going to change mine to a different folder. For the language, there's really only two options. You can either pick from Java or Kotlin. I'm going to leave it as Java because that's the language that I know. But if you're a Kotlin developer, feel free to choose Kotlin. As far as the minimum SDK goes, that's a judgment call you're going to have to make as an app developer. There's a number of options you can pick. You can pick all the way from API 16 all the way up to API 30. And what this is really dictating is what is the minimum version a phone must be running to install your application. So if you pick API 23, which is Android 6.0, and somebody's using Android 5.0, they're not going to be able to install your application. So you might be saying to yourself, well, this is an easy fix, right? I just picked the lowest API. That way my stuff runs on 99.8% of the devices. And the problem with that is you're going to have a lot of workarounds that you're going to have to do to make newer SDK features function properly on older devices. This will result in more work and potentially more bugs. At the time this video is being recorded, which is December of 2020, my recommendation is to use Marshmallow, which is Android 6.0, unless you believe that your users are likely to have older devices, in which case I would choose 5.0. And the reason I see 5.0 is kind of the bare minimum is because 5.0 Lollipop is when Google introduced material design to Android Core. In my opinion, this makes it sufficiently modern, and 94.1% compatibility is nothing to sneeze at. For demonstration purposes though, I'm going to choose Marshmallow, but certainly if you have an older phone, feel free to choose a lower SDK. And once you're done, click Finish. It might take about a minute or so to load everything, but once it's done, you should see something similar to this. Although on the left-hand side, I've expanded all of these folders just so we can walk through each of them and talk about what they all do. Feel free to do the same if you'd like to follow along. The first file we're going to look at is this AndroidManifest.xml. The first thing you probably notice is that XML is in use here, and XML is used everywhere in Android. We'll be referring to and modifying this file periodically throughout these videos, but for the purpose today, just know that Android Manifest is all about metadata about your application and the activities that contain within it. So we have our application block, and in the application block, we have things like the text label, the icons, and then the theme. And then inside the application block is our activity block. Right now, we just have one activity. That's our main activity. And you could think of an activity as a screen that shows up on Android or another screen that one screen might switch to. And we'll go in depth into activities in future videos. Next thing we're going to look at is the Java folder. And there's technically two of these folders. One is just normal and the other has in parentheses generated. We'll talk about what that means in a second. For the first Java folder, this is just going to contain all of your Java code that's for your application. You won't find Java code anywhere else. Under Java, I have three additional folders. One is for my main code, and the other two are for tests. Because we won't be covering any unit tests in any of these videos, I'm just going to actually delete these just to save some space. Right now, we only have one activity. It's called main activity. It's going to be the activity that starts up at the exact time that the app is started up. Because this is a very basic activity, there's not a whole lot going on here. There's this one method called onCreate, and this is what's called a lifecycle event. And as you probably guessed from the name, this is the lifecycle event that is called on creation of the activity. And this method really only does one thing of interest, and it calls this method called set content view, and then it's specified with a layout called activity main.xml, which you can see is located over here as well. So what this is basically saying is on create of the activity, take the contents of activity main.xml and show it to the user. 
And inside activity main.xmod, there's not a whole lot going on. The one thing of interest here is this text view, which is really nothing more than just a text label. And as you can see on the left here, it's just a text label that says, hello world. Now, when you're designing layouts with Android Studio, you can do so in one of three ways. You can either do it purely with code, you can split it between code and a visual preview, or you could just design it entirely with a drag and drop. It really depends on what you're building, but I personally find myself using a blend of split and design. The only time I really ever use code only is if I'm doing something where I just don't need a preview. Now before we go any further, we need to go back to this Java generated folder because it's actually relevant now. You may have picked up on the fact that r.layout.activityMain is a valid variable, but you might be wondering where that was even defined. And the simple answer is it wasn't defined by us. What happens is Android Studio will see that you put a new XML file under layout and then it will generate new Java code that points this variable to that XML file. And this is something that happens completely transparent to us as Android developers and we don't need to concern ourselves ever with anything in the generated Java code folder. So next we're gonna look at is the res folder, which is sort of for resources. Now remember I said the Java folder contains just Java code, nothing else. Well, the resources folder contains everything except Java code. Although you can put a variety of things in this folder, it's most commonly gonna contain all of your views as well as your vector assets and image assets. The drawable folder is where you're gonna put things like vector assets as well as images. The layout folder is going to be for your layout. And layouts could contain a variety of things like main activity view, fragments, list items, menus, and more. Next is the mipmap folder, and this is going to be similar to the drawable folder, except the mipmap folder is going to contain several variations of the same image. And the purpose is that if you have a small phone that wants to use a smaller version, then it can. If you have a larger phone that wants to use a larger version, then it can as well. So like the launch icon for this application is in you know medium high, extra high, double extra high, triple extra high DPI. So a large phone would probably use this big one, and a small phone would use the smaller one. But in code, you refer to all of them by the same name, and you let the phone figure out which one it wants to use. Next is the values folder, which is going to store various constant values about a number of different things, such as colors and strings. Colors is pretty straightforward. It just matches this name, such as purple underscore 200, to this hex code. The reason strings.xml exists is primarily for if your application is going to be in a number of different languages. What you could do is, is you could have a bunch of constant string values in this file, and then you can just let the phone reference whichever one it is relevant to the language that the phone is set to. Obviously, if you just hard code text into XML files, then you'll just be stuck with the English version. And if your app is just only ever going to be English, then it might not be a big deal. This then becomes a file which allows you to just kind of collect all of your strings in one spot for easier management. So how you use this, or even if you use it at all, is completely up to you. Then the last folder in here is called themes, and this is going to describe, as the name suggests, the actual theme that your application will have application-wide. You'll notice also there's a second themes file, and it's a night themes file. And the whole purpose of this is to have one theme that's a light version and one theme that's dark version. That's because Android is going to this model where people choose dark theme at the system level for their Android device. And when they do this, that choice is propagated into these apps and your app can tell whether or not that they've set dark mode for their entire device. And if they have, it can just apply dark mode automatically. This removes the need to actually make a toggleable dark mode in your app itself. It would just do it automatically. Of course, for Android devices that don't support dark mode out of the box, it would simply just fall back to the light theme. And the last folder is called Gradle Scripts. And what Gradle is, is it's the piece of software that's going to actually take all of this stuff and actually do the build on your application to get it into an APK and then install it on your phone. We can largely ignore most of these files with the exception of build.gradle for the module. In here, it's going to be necessary to modify your versions as you make new versions of your application. And then the more important thing is this section called Dependencies. People build tons of different Android libraries and components, and if you ever come across one, it's gonna have you add an implementation block, and this is where you're going to put it. But more on that later. And then finally, to run your application on your phone, simply plug your phone in and click the play button. Your app should then show up on your phone, and it should look something like this. And that's everything we're gonna cover in this video. Hopefully it was very useful for helping you to get Android Studio installed, and then also getting oriented to how this project works and functions. Everything that we're going to do from here on out is just going to be building upon what we have right here. If you're watching this video the day it comes out, I apologize, there won't be any additional videos to watch, but if you're not, you can look in the bottom right-hand corner to find the playlist, and then you can go to the next one right away. 
If you have any questions at all about anything you saw in this video, please be sure to leave them below in the comments. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you in the next video. Take care.